Welcome back to Court TV Live. Glad to have you along with us nearly 20 years after Scott Peterson was convicted of the murders of his wife, Lacey, and unborn son, Connor. He is trying to get a new trial, and this afternoon is a huge day here in Redwood City, California. Both sides will be presenting their final arguments in front of a judge relating to juror misconduct. Peterson's attorneys say one of the jurors, juror number seven, you know her as strawberry shortcake line on her questionnaire when she filled it out at the time. Last night I spoke with Scott Peterson's sister-in-law, Janie Peterson, about the case and about their family's hope for a new trial. Take a look. Joining us now is Janie Peterson, Scott Peterson's sister-in-law, who has um, been instrumental in the fight for, in your case, from your perspective, uh, justice. And, and, and now here we are tomorrow, the culmination of this kind of hybrid process. Um, and it has been going on for months. Start with, how are you feeling? Do you, you know, um, are you optimistic that at the end of the day, um, the judge is going to go with your side and, and grant a new trial? We are. We're optimistic. Um, we we feel that the evidence showed that there was juror misconduct. The questionnaire was filled out improperly. Uh, that in turn shifted the burden to the prosecution with a presumption of bias, and they had the job of showing. Uh, that this juror was not biased. And uh, when you look at the weight of the evidence, they, they didn't bring a whole lot of evidence uh, to counter that presumption. Uh, so we, we have a lot of confidence and are very hopeful that this will result in Scott being granted a new trial. What about the argument that, uh, yeah, we brought her on. She's under oath and she said she wasn't biased. So there you go, Judge, she wasn't biased. Well, there's a presumption of bias, and I think there's also case law that states that that's not sufficient. So they're, they're going to be looking at the entire body of evidence um, from prior to her selection as a juror, the juror selection process, uh, the, the trial, and behavior and things after the trial, media interviews that she's done and things like that. Pretty much the only thing they aren't looking at is what actually happened in the deliberation room. Oh, although there was a little some testimony from uh, one of the other jurors yes. that came out and, and basically said she did, in, in his word, uh, his words blurted out, um, you know, he's going to have to pay for a little man. One of the prongs, or one of the things brought up by the defense, little man, uh, the nickname that she had for her child, she associated it to Connor. Is that, uh, do you think that's significant? Uh, we don't know that that was a nickname that she had for her own child, uh, but that is a nickname that she did give Connor, and um, it, it's evidence. It, it goes to evidence in this case as far as um, in, any type of bias is, uh, it, there's a presumption of bias and they have to show there's not. So um, something like that doesn't help their side show that there's not a bias. This is one step in a very long process uh, that uh, you've had many steps in. Let's say he gets a new trial. What's to say that he's not convicted again? I mean, the, the bodies were found in the San Francisco Bay. The, uh, all of the main evidence, Amber Fry is still out there, uh, the recordings. Um, why wouldn't you think, all right, well, new trial, but it's going to be the same result? We just have a much better understanding of the evidence at this point. And it's very clear that Lacey was alive the morning that Scott left for the marina. He's at his warehouse. She's alive in the neighborhood. Um, there's multiple tips and multiple evidence showing that she encountered the burglars uh, that robbed the house across the street from hers. And um, there's evidence that uh, the fetal development expert uh, shows that Connor lived possibly till January. So it's just an entirely different body of evidence that this jury is going to see compared to what the jury saw in the first trial. How involved has Scott been in this process? Um, I'd say very much so. I mean, he's, you know, uh, has access to... Uh, research, the law library, any topic that's been covered in his appeal or his habeas. Uh, he was very actively involved in uh, communicating with his attorneys and providing what he knows and uh, as far as behind the scenes and what he can add to any arguments they might be making. Let's say you lose. How significant is this decision for you and your overall plans? This is the first time 
this is being addressed. If we do lose uh, this issue, we will be brought back again uh, before the California Supreme Court. If uh, we do not seek, if we do not get relief at that point, we will then pursue it in federal court, along with all of the other issues that were in both Scott's appeal and habeas petition, except the death penalty ones, because the death penalty has been overturned. What do you say to someone who says, Janie, you seem like a nice person, um, but gosh, I think you're getting hoodwinked by Scott, and he's not being honest, he's never been honest with you, and, and um, he did it. It's obvious that he did it to me. The bodies were in the bay. Um, come on. Well, my belief in Scott's innocence not only comes from my conversations with Scott, but it comes from knowing the evidence, knowing the timeline, knowing the forensics. And this is a case that has no timeline. This is a 20-year-old case, one of the most highly publicized cases in the history of the United States. And no one can say what time Scott allegedly committed this crime. No one can say where he did it. There's no forensics. The time doesn't work. The evidence doesn't work. Scott is innocent, and it's clear. And there's so much evidence to the contrary showing what did happen. Everything that we've done for the last 20 years has brought us one step closer to finding out what happened to Lacey and Connor. And everything we find out further confirms Scott's innocence and also brings us closer to the truth. The roaches have not seemed to have wa wavered at all. Um, do you understand? Uh, but what are your feelings towards the, what they're going through and, and having to now deal with this? We as human beings, we tend to trust that you know, the police are going to do their job. The prosecution is not going to go after people that, that aren't guilty. And um, juries get it right, but uh, sometimes they don't. And this is a situation where they didn't. And um, that's, that's why we're fighting so hard and we're not going to stop. Are the bodies in the bay the, what convicted him? Or was it Amber and the lies and the recordings combination? What, what stands out to you as the most significant evidence that you think the, the jury gravitated towards? I feel like the jurors, you know, if, if uh, the bodies weren't found where they were, I think people would have had a lot harder time convicting him. Uh, I do think that uh, his infidelity made people uh, categorically not believe anything he said. When in reality, if you look at what he says, his lies are to Amber and they're about Amber. Uh, whereas if you look at the date that this crime occurred, December 24th, there are no lies to law enforcement by Scott about the events of December 24th. There, there aren't any. Um, and how you can not tell a lie to the police about the day your wife went missing and yet be guilty of her murder is it just it doesn't make sense his lies are about adultery and um surrounding adultery not around murder for many people they can't get across get through um the hurdle of well all right if he didn't do it who did? And why on earth would they go to the trouble of risking so much by transporting her body just to set him up? You know, that's what the evidence shows. The evidence shows that Lacey was alive when he left. Um, we had a missing person, and the police immediately publicized Scott's alibi. And, and it was a very high-profile case. It was no secret where Scott was the day of December 24th. Um, the evidence shows Lacey was alive. Scott left for the marina. Everyone knew he was at the marina, and everyone knew there was a public suspicion of Scott. Uh, so, you know, why bad people do what they do, I can't answer that. Uh, but I, I was not surprised when their bodies were found there, because that's exactly what I thought would happen when I heard the police publicize his alibi. What about the, the dyed hair, the money in the car, the, um, the, the water purifying near the border? Yes, yes. Um, the people gravitate. And that's another one right, of the things like, right. oh, that's mm -hmm. you know, he, he was fleeing. Well, and if you look at the courtroom testimony, no one in law enforcement thought he was fleeing. He'd actually gone to Mexico while Lacey was missing for work. He, he'd returned. Um, he was in San Diego regularly visiting family while Lacey was missing. San Diego borders Mexico. So the fact that he was arrested in San Diego with family or meeting up with family when that's broadcast on national news that Scott Peterson was arrested 30 miles from the Mexican border, I live 20 miles from the Mexican border. So it creates a perception that he's fleeing. 
but but he wasn't. And at that point, he was living out of his car. Uh, he literally was, uh, you know, he, it's not that he wasn't in Modesto permanently, but, you know, people were outside his home. Uh, the media knew where he lived. People were in his yard with um, mega horns calling him to come outside. Two different occasions, people broke into his home. And uh, so he pretty much was living out of his car. And, and Are you confident that 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 time and then I, I was there I, I, mm -hmm. I was outside yeah. house a lot yeah. too I yeah. called him incessantly I think you got <laughs> but hit with some hail one day if I remember correctly <laughs> the high profile nature of mm -hmm. this the idea that at the end of the day Judge Mazzullo would mm -hmm. be the person that gave Scott Peterson a new right. trial yeah um, how confident are you that that doesn't enter into the equation well you really hope it doesn't because it shouldn't no it absolutely and, shouldn't yeah, but, yeah. so but, but again, it is an extremely high profile case. And, um, you know, our, our hope is that uh, the court follows the law. And, and um, I, I, I think that we have that. And I think that the law's on our side. And uh, I think Scott will be granted a new trial. And if, if, if we don't get relief in state court, I'm pretty confident we'll get it in federal court. Cliff Gardner's uh, done a, a, a lot of work in this case. Um, uh, with the appeal, uh, many years ago, we I did an interview with him, and, and one of the things they expressed was that Scott Peterson didn't have any of the behaviors that someone normally capable of this type of crime, which is as heinous as it gets, um, had. Give us a sense of, of who he is for people that don't know. I mean, who is this, this Scott Peterson who the state says, oh, he was Mr. Um, he, he never wanted, he wanted to be perfect, and that's why he didn't just divorce Lacey. Um, from your standpoint, who is he? What kind of person is he? I'm not good at questions like that. Um, you know, to me, he's a brother. I met him when he was 13 years old, when, when I started dating his older brother. Um, he was an usher in our wedding. I watched him grow up, uh, be a teenager. Uh, you know, watched him and Lacey date and fall in love. And and you know, we'd see him on the holidays, and they would look at our kids at first and be like, you know, we're never, we're not, we're not gonna have kids because our kids were just. <laughs> You know, and then every every year we'd see them, it'd be like, well, we're gonna, you know, have kids when we're 30, and then the next year they're trying, and then the next year, you know, they had a baby on the way. So Scott and Lacey were hardworking, um, hospitable people. They loved to host in their home. Scott was an excellent uh, craftsman, loved to work with his hands, loved to fish, loved the outdoors. Lacey could take anything and make it beautiful. And um, that's just a little bit about who they were. How much um, has this, uh, the, the, the daily, uh, the, the pain, you know, missing Scott and Lacey for your family, um, it, does it go, does it get better, or what, how difficult is it? Is it? I, I think it goes in cycles, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's heavier than other times, but, um, but like I said, it's where, it's, it's the weight that we have to bear, and we have an incredible support system. We have countless people that pray for our family and check in for our family and take care of our family and surround us and love us and believe us and trust us. And, and that's really important, the, the number of people that believe us is, um, that that's very impactful, and it makes it, it makes it that much easier to go on. Is that number growing? Absolutely. Every day it grows. There's nobody that ever goes from thinking Scott is innocent to thinking he's guilty. But every day there's somebody who thought Scott was guilty and now believes he's innocent. Uh, tomorrow in that courtroom, um, you'll be there uh, with several members of your family, and the Roaches will be there. They'll be in the jury box. They'll be looking at Scott. Um, What's that like? I mean, you kind of went through it once before in a hearing. Um, how difficult a process is that? You know, we all know each other. We have a foundation. We've known each other for years. We were all at Scott and Lacey's wedding, and it's there's not, you know, in, in different events throughout um, their lives. And so there's not a... Uh, I, I don't feel a, a sense of animosity or, or hatred or... Um, you know, I have nothing but empathy and, and care for all of her family and friends. 
Uh, final question, same, same as the first. How uh, are you optimistic going into tomorrow? We're very optimistic, very optimistic that Scott will be granted a new trial.